Let's all stand up for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, again, and um, for this season, Lord, just to remember what you've done for us, Thanksgiving this last week, to remind us to be so thankful of what you did in that manger. And um, Lord, as we um, enter this season, Lord, and um, we're with family and friends and um, all of that, Lord, I pray that you would bless it and keep us safe and um, watch over us, Lord, and may we be that witness for Christ to all those around us. Lord, we thank you for hope, the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. This world is not what it was meant to be. All this pain, all this suffering. There's a better place waiting for me in heaven. Every tear will be wiped away. Every sorrow and sin he raised will dance on seas of amazing grace in heaven, in heaven. I'm going home where the streets are golden, every chain is broken. chain is broken chain is broken
The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne. Before the Holy One of Heaven. It's so to my king. I bring an offering of worship to my king. No one on earth deserves the No praises. one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering to you. Over the skies of Bethlehem appeared a star. While angels sang to lonely shepherds. Three wise men seeking truth. Travel from afar, hoping to find the child from heaven, falling on their knees, they bow before the humble Prince of Peace. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering to you. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne. Before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your blood, and it's only through your mercy, Lord, I come. I bring an offering of worship 
You can be seated if you'd like. Okay, there I hear myself. <clears throat> so uh, last week, we talked about uh, the start of Advent, which uh, this is the first Sunday of Advent. And we kind of, I, I talked a little bit about uh, the, uh, the Christmas songs that we sing and how they're theologically infused. And, and rather, most of them are rather uh, rather deep, especially the ones that were 
uh, written a while ago. And, um, and I encourage us to, to think about what those words are saying, because those words are pointing to a meaning um, that we can just gloss over if we're just kind of mouthing the words. And so th today, we're starting Advent, and there's symbolism in, in um, a lot of the things that we, we have out, uh, and in the songs that we sing, and... and um, so I just wanted to touch briefly on those, those symbols because the symbol is a physical rep representation of something that has meaning uh, behind it that might be invisible. So, for example, we have the Advent wreath, and it's uh, circular, which signifies eternity. So there's no beginning and no end which is God. It's made out of evergreens, which symbolizes eternal life. We have holly here, which is the um, passion of Christ, and there's you probably can't see them from there, but there's little leaves here that have some thorns, which represent the crown of thorns that Christ uh, that was placed on Christ's head, that uh, his suffering, the blood that was shed. We have pine cones, and um, one of the fascinating things about pine cones is the seeds, which bring new life, are released in fire, in you know trauma. And so those symbolize that new life is resurrection, life and resurrection. So you can, in this wreath, you see kind of the full story of the gospel. And when, when we're out and about, you know, if we see a wreath on the door or we see lights, that, you know, that can be a reminder from us and we can stop and think about what that meaning is. And so we're, today we're going to start um, Advent, and we've got four four candles here of different, well, five candles, but uh, today is the first Sunday of Advent, which represents hope, and and so in our reading, in our music, we talked about, um, uh, what was the, the wording, into our hope, into our fears, the Savior of the world appears. That's that's what we're talking talking about today. And then uh, next week, we'll light the candle of peace. And then the third Sunday is a pink candle that represents joy. And then the fourth Sunday, um, which will be the, the Sunday before Christmas, is another purple candle that uh, uh, represents love. And, and the purple has the symbolism of royalty. Christ is the king. He's the sovereign. Um, <clears throat> the uh, center candle then is the Christ candle, which will light on Christmas Eve, and that symbolizes that Christ is the light of the world. Um, he has come before. That's what Israel, the Israelites, were hoping they had eager, eager anticipation of the Messiah coming. We've seen that fulfilled in him coming, and he's here. But we also have eager anticipation in him coming again. And so we can kind of relate to, to Israel, ancient Israel, in that eager anticipation. Um, so we were driving in today, like I said, we're, we're going to light the candle of uh, hope today. And there was a um, guy was talking on the radio, and Kathy heard it. I wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> and, um, but to paraphrase, the guy was saying, um, talking about hope, and he says that don't give up hope because hope is really about waiting 
And we don't know when our hope will be um, realized. And we get impatient. We can, we can give up. And so the idea is to grasp that hope. Because our hope isn't based in, you know, oh, I wish. Our hope has been proven in the past by Christ's coming, by what he did on the cross, by him being raised. And that's what we have to look forward to when he comes again. It's real. And he shall reign forevermore. Amen. Amen. Rejoice, rejoice, 
Christ. The prophets, prophets of Israel all spoke of the coming of the Christ, of how a Savior would be, a, be born a king in the line of David. They spoke of how he would rule the world wisely and bless all nations. On Christmas Day, the Christ of our hope was born. On Good Friday, the Christ of our hope died. On Easter Day, the Christ of our hope rose from the dead. He then ascended into heaven, and on the last day, the Christ of our hope will come again to restore his kingdom over all things on earth. As the follower of Christ, we await his return, and we light this candle to remember that he came to us humbly in the manger at Bethlehem and gave light to the world. So he is coming again in power to deliver his people. We light this candle to remind us to be alert and to watch for his return. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the hope that you give to us. Will you help us prepare our hearts for, the, for your son's coming? Bless our worship this morning. Speak through Mike and bless his, his teaching. Help us to live holy and righteous lives. We ask it in the name of the one born in Bethlehem. Amen. Oh, come, desire the nations bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Mid thou our sad division see. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, our hope. In your name we pray, amen. Our ushers have come forward. Let's pray. Father God, what a, what a joy again it is, Lord, just to be in your house, Lord, in your house with our family. Lord, I just, uh, I, I lift our service up to you this morning. Lord, I just pray for those who can't be here this morning for various reasons. And God, I just, uh, Lord, in this, in this season that we're, we're thinking about Christmas now and in gifts, Lord, may we just forever be reminded, Lord, just the gifts that you've given us, Lord, just the gift of salvation, the gift of your hope, the joy that we have in you. 
And Lord, as we give our tithes and offerings, Father, I just pray that we're just continually reminded of that. And Lord, I thank you again, Lord, that you've always met our needs and you continue to meet our needs, Lord, in just this very small congregation. Lord, I just ask that you receive our tithes and offerings and just multiply them. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody have anything they'd love to share with our church family this morning? Well, again, not a lot to share um, today. Again, we got no, December. is just a couple days away. Isn't that something? Um, prayer is an incredibly powerful thing. I think everybody in here can, has, can attest to that at one time or another, either in your lives personally or somebody you know that uh, miracles do happen. Our Savior tells us that the, you know, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And if you need prayer for yourself or somebody else today, please, please, please come up here after the service. We'll make sure we take that time to pray. If you, for any reason, again, you know, miss one of our services, again, we've got the, the CDs, DVDs in the back. There's something you can fill out back there if you want, uh, you know, some from several weeks back or something, or full books of the Bible that Mike has taught through. That's all available. Just let us know. And then also, too, next Saturday being the first Saturday of the month, we will have our men's group downstairs at 8 o'clock. So if you got, can, guys, please come and join us for breakfast and a great time of fellowship. So, again, that's next Saturday, the first Saturday of the month. Again, our goal is uh, to meet on the first and the third Saturdays. So, um, you know, depending on, you know, the holiday season, we're not going to change the date. We'll just, you know, s skip a day and something when, when that comes. So, again, uh, next Saturday at 8 o'clock, uh, be here for that. And then... Um, We've got our, do we still need readers for Christmas Eve? Yeah. So again, we got Christmas Eve will be here before we know it. And if you'd like to be one of the readers for our service, please let Mike know uh, within the next week or two so we can get that laid out as well. So again, it's so great to see everybody here this morning. If everybody just take a brief moment, just stand up and uh, say hello to somebody else. And then our children are just. A guy this coming Wednesday on at uh, 7 o'clock. So if you can join us on Wednesday evening. Um, Different uh, book from the uh, other uh, minor prophets that we've been studying and that um, uh, the other minor prophets were warning of the judgment to come of them being taken into captivity into Babylon. Haggai warns them when they get back into the land again. So it's a, he's after the, um, the uh, captivity. So uh, neat, neat book. So looking forward to that on Wednesday evening. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Um, for your word today, Lord, as we again look in and, and see what you have for us, Lord, and uh, just pray that you bless it to our hearts, to our lives, and thank you for the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing. Now we're in chapter 12 in the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, last time, last time, <laughs> Last time our message was rest, and uh, to have true rest, we need to not play games with God, heed the warnings, and we need to come to Jesus. There it is there. And then today's um, uh, message is mercy, not sacrifice, as we study the first 14 verses of chapter 12. Ironically, chapter 11 ends with Jesus saying that he's the one who gives rest, and now in chapter 12, we're going to see him doing good works on the Sabbath day, on the rest day, which the Jews are going to accuse him of. Now in chapter 12, uh, um, it's kind of a pivotal point, as I said last week, in the Gospel of Matthew. And, uh, it, you know, after chapter 12, Jesus only talks to the public in parables, and so it's a pivotal chapter in this gospel, and we'll talk about that as we move along through it. And uh, so Jesus is going to be accused of uh, healing and doing good works on the Sabbath day and working on the Sabbath day. And, uh, but he is the Sabbath. He is the Lord of rest. And uh, the religious leaders weren't resting on the Sabbath, rather, they were frantically working, trying to keep the Sabbath. Are you following? They weren't really resting on the Sabbath. They were working to try to keep the Sabbath with all of its rules and all of its rituals. So let's pick it up in chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, 
And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what, it, what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into the synagogue, their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? that they might accuse him. Verse 11. And then he said to them, what man, is, this is in true Jewish form. Jesus answers their question with a question. Exactly. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Verse 13, then he said to the, to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole, as whole as the other. And then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. People love to focus on sacrifice at the expense of mercy, uh, on adhering to a bunch of rules over compassion. But when we're focused on sacrifice instead of mercy, on rules instead of mercy, several problems start to arise. And so we're going to just have two points today, and they're bewares. And so the first point is beware of legalism. Beware of legalism. The Oxford Dictionary defines legalism as dependence on moral law rather than on personal religious faith. So chapter 12, verse 1 again. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, my question is, what were they doing there? And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, in Exodus 20, the Jews were told to do no work on the Sabbath. It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Exodus 29 says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. So that's the Sabbath. That's what it says about the Sabbath. And Sabbath observance was, in fact, one of the three most important and distinctive badges of Jewish life, along with circumcision and dietary laws. But what happened is the Jews started to develop, to develop all of these rules and regulations concerning what work was. And the rabbinical writings called the Talmud and the Mishnah, which is a part of the Talmud, has 24 chapters devoted on keeping the Sabbath day. And these are really the traditions of the rabbis, not the word of God. It's just the tradition of the rabbis. In fact, in the Mishnah, it says the, rule about, the rules about the Sabbath are as mountains hanging by a hair for teaching of Scripture thereon is scanty, and the rules, many. So the teaching of Scripture on all of these Sabbath rules is scanty. It's few, but the rules, oh man, they are many. And so in the Talmud, the Talmudic Sabbath rules, 
It says, so if, you're carry, if you carried an object heavier than a dried fig, they said that that was work on the Sabbath. If you had a wooden leg or false teeth, well, that was bearing a burden on the Sabbath. Those had to come off. They said that you ladies couldn't look in the mirror on the Sabbath because you might see a gray hair, pluck it out, and that was considered work. You couldn't take a bath on the Sabbath because the water might spill out onto the floor, and that was considered mopping the floor. You could stop someone from bleeding on the Sabbath, but you couldn't do anything that would promote healing. And we'll talk about that more uh, when we get to the withered hand. You couldn't travel from your home more than 3,000 feet on the Sabbath, according to their rules. So to get around that, before the Sabbath, they would extend a rope from their house as far as they wanted, and that was considered an extension of their house. If you spit on the Sabbath, you had to make sure you didn't scuff it with your sandal. If you did, it would be cultivating the soil and thus performing work. Silly, huh? Really silly. Modern Orthodox Jews keep the Sabbath as well. For example, they will not start their car on the Sabbath because starting their car creates a spark in the spark plugs, and that's kindling a fire. Work. So they won't start their cars on the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath was intended to be a day of rest, a, a day off. But instead, they, they made it into a day of tension. They had to work hard to not work. And so it was legalism. And that's, of course, never what God intended for it to be. And Jesus is going to go even further to say that he's the actual fulfillment of Sabbath. He is the Lord of Sabbath. And so here Jesus' disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath, violating their rules, but not violating God's law. Verse 3. But he said to them... But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? The first thing Jesus is saying to them here is, read your Bibles. Have you not read? Read your Bibles. Uh, you're not going to get it unless you read the Bible. The Jews were famous for reading and quoting the traditions of the rabbis, the rules of the rabbis, but not the word of God. The rules and the traditions of the rabbis became more important and superseded the word of God. And this is true in many churches today. Many denominations are built around the traditions of men rather than on the word of God itself. And many would rather take the word of some book or some video that they watch rather than God's word. Whenever anyone says to you that the writing of this person or that person or some video supersedes God's word, run for your life. And so Jesus said, remember what D David did when he was hungry with his men. He entered the house of God, the tabernacle at that time. And he ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to do. And so the showbread was in the tabernacle. And it was that bread that was in there that only the priests were to eat and only the priests were to use. It was 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And the, these 12 loaves were replaced every Sabbath day. So David and his men went in on the Sabbath when they were fleeing from King Saul. And they talked to the priest. And the priest gave them his okay with some uh, uh, conditions. And they ate the bread on the Sabbath because they were hungry. Jesus is telling them that human need is more important than the command in that case. It's mercy, not sacrifice. But it's more than that. David was the rightful king of Israel at that point in time. But at that point in 1 Samuel 21, he was fleeing from Saul who was usurping the throne. 
If David had been on the throne where he belonged, they wouldn't have been starving, they wouldn't have been running, and they wouldn't have needed to go into the tabernacle and eat the bread. Likewise, fast forward to Jesus, likewise, Jesus is also the rightful king. But they rejected him, and that caused them to be hungry and poor and having to eat from the fields just as David did. Remember, Jesus is the son of David or the greater than David. So Jesus is connecting himself with that story here. Verse 5. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Of course, speaking of himself, one is capital O. So every Sabbath, the priests offered sacrifices several times uh, uh, during the Sabbath day, among all the other tasks that they did. So they were working on the Sabbath, and even more than usual, but it was allowed because they were serving God. They were in the tabernacle working or in the temple. And Jesus saying, he's saying, why weren't they guilty? So the service in the temple was greater than the sacrifice of the priests, and now Jesus is greater than even the temple. And he takes precedence over the temple. The law, remember, folks, the law, the law, everything in the law points to Jesus, is a witness, is a testimony that points us and guides us to Jesus. And so they were hung up on their traditions, but they weren't recognizing the person of Christ, who he was. And remember, that's Matthew. one of Matthew's main um, things that he wants to stress is who Jesus is. You need to realize who he is. And so they weren't recognizing that. And the Sabbath, listen, guys, this is important. The Sabbath is not a day. It's a person. The Sabbath is a person. It's Jesus. One greater than the temple is here. I love what Carson says in his commentary. He says, The authority of the temple laws shielded the priests from guilt. The authority of Jesus shields his disciples from guilt. Isn't that good news? It's the authority of Christ that shields us from guilt. That's why there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And Blomberg writes, It's not therefore the particular situation in which Jesus finds himself that justifies his disciples' behavior, but his very nature and authority, which can transcend the law and make permissible for his disciples what once was forbidden. Paul the Apostle said this in Colossians 2, verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a what? Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found where? In Christ. So they were just shadows of the true rest that would come in Christ. And so when people take a day off every week, it's actually a reminder of the rest that's available in Christ Jesus. People want to get all caught up into legalism and rules in order to be found worthy before God. But the more they do, the further they stray from God. How easy it is just to come to Jesus instead. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you Sabbath. Verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And so this is the second time Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The Pharisees were splitting hairs with their technicalities about the Sabbath. 
They fail to understand compassion for people's basic needs. They would rather see someone die for the sake of their rules than to show mercy and compassion. And Jesus warned them about this over and over again. And that's what legalism does, folks. It causes people to be judgmental, to be unloving, to be merciless, and to be faithless. Jesus, in essence, is saying, you Pharisees don't understand the intent of the law. Later on in Matthew, he's going to say of the Pharisees that they bind heavy burdens on men's shoulders, and they're not willing to lift a finger to move those burdens. So they put all this guilt on people, but they don't do anything to try to get rid of that guilt at all. And verse 8 says there, uh, for the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is the fulfillment of it, guys. He is the fulfillment of rest, and not only that, he invented it. He is Lord of it. And in fact, uh, last Sunday we uh, saw in chapter 11, Jesus say, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. So for the Christian, for the Christian, every day is Sabbath. Why? Because we are in Christ. We are in Sabbath. So for the Christian, we don't have a Sabbath day. Every day is the Sabbath day. We are in Christ. And, you know, I know we uh, devote uh, Sundays to the Lord. We come to church and all of that, um, uh, you know. But, you know, for me, it's probably the hardest day of the week. For, you know, it's the hardest I work all week long. You know, when I get home, I'm exhausted. Yet it's always right to serve the Lord on the Sabbath. But in fact, every day is the Sabbath for the Christian. And we should be serving him every single day. So beware of legalism. Secondly, beware of withering away. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? So according to their traditions, you could save a person's life on the Sabbath. If they were bleeding to death, you could stop the bleeding on the Sabbath. But you couldn't do anything that would promote the healing of that wound. You couldn't put medicine on it. You couldn't do anything like that. Anything that would promote the healing, you had to wait until the Sabbath was over, and then you could tend to it. And again, this was just a ridiculous misinterpretation of the law and what it means to work on the Sabbath. And notice, they wanted to accuse him. Now, this was their agenda. This was the reason they said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. It was their agenda. They didn't care about the Sabbath. That's not they, what they were interested in. They were interested in accusing him. They knew that Jesus probably would attempt to heal the man if he was there. And it was a setup. In fact, it's possible that they put the man there themselves. And if he healed him, he was violating the Sabbath in their minds. And to, hit, to the man's surprise, he gets healed out of it. He doesn't ask for healing. At least it doesn't tell us that. He doesn't ask for healing. Jesus just heals him. But notice the Pharisees asked if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath. Their question presumes that Jesus is going to heal. So they believed in his healing power because they had seen it over and over again, but not in his claims. Also, this man's hand had been withered for some time. It didn't just happen, right? And so he was not in any immediate danger, so Jesus could have waited until after the Sabbath to heal him. But he didn't. Instead, he chose to do good 
on the Sabbath. In fact, there are seven healings recorded in the Gospels that Jesus performed on the Sabbath. Seven times he did it. Verse 11. And then he said to them, What man is there among you as one sheep, and if he falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value than is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So Jesus point blank says, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. All of the rules, all of the laws don't apply if you can do good on the Sabbath. And so they uh, would, the, you know, Pharisees and all, they would work on the Sabbath in order to save a sheep. See, they would do that. And they would justify it by saying it was merciful for the sheep. But we need to understand that sheep were not pets. They represented money. There was a value on them. And in other words, because money was involved, the Jews would think nothing of breaking the Sabbath in order to save the sheep. Are you following? And so Jesus is saying, how much more valuable is man than a sheep? They were hypocrites. He was calling them out. Now, we live in a day and age today where the lives of animals are being put above the lives of people. Uh, it's against the law to kill certain animals. And we've all seen those commercials on TV of all the poor animals that are, have been abused and are shaking. You know, they always get the ones that are shaking on those commercials. And the commercials are like, what, 10 minutes long, it seems? They're just really long commercials. And they're all concerned with animals that don't have a home. But they're not concerned that we're aborting millions of babies. Now, what's wrong with this picture, folks? It's a woman's right to choose, they say. So the rights of animals are more important than the rights of an unborn baby. That's what it's getting to. And yet man alone was made in the image of God, not animals. Man alone. Now, I'm not for abusing animals. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But to put animals above people like that is... It's off. So Jesus says, of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. That phrase, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Um, uh, Blomberg uh, writes on this, and he says, Bonnard calls this principle disturbing. For if generalized, it would make all organized church life impossible. There is always some good to undertake in preference to a religious duty. But Jesus is not contrasting some good with religious duty. He does not encourage the Jews to stop worshiping. He is contrasting activity with inactivity. See, they wouldn't lift a finger on the Sabbath to do any good. See, and that's what he's contrasting here. Verse 13. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. The man stretched out his hand in faith. Whether he was planted there or not, he listened to Jesus, and he stretched out his hand in faith. He, he obeyed the words of Jesus. He could have said, no way, I'm not going to do this. But he stretched out his hand, and listen, as he stretched out his hand, Jesus said, stretch out your hand. Okay. In faith, I'm going to do this. What do I, what do I have to lose? <laughs> so in faith, he stretched out his hand. And as he stretched out his hand, guess what? His hand stretched out. As he was stretching out his hand, his hand stretched out. You know, guys, some of us need to stretch out our hands in faith. We've been uh, spiritual couch potatoes, so to speak. We need to get off the couch and stretch out. Our spiritual muscles get atrophied, just like our physical muscles do. Many people are atrophied. They're sleepy, or as Paul said, wake up from your slumber. 
And even many Christians allow themselves to atrophy. They, they just let themselves wither away spiritually. And Jesus is saying through this miracle, hey, just don't sit there and wither away. Stretch it out. Stretch out your faith. Stretch out your hand. And the hand represents, by the way, acting in faith. That's what the hand represents. That's what we do work with, right? Acting out in faith. It, re it represents putting your belief into practice. And as you stretch out your faith, your faith stretches out. Verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. So they, they see this miracle among the other ones, and what do they do? They plot as to how they might destroy him. Important point in this, miracles don't cause people to believe. They don't cause people to believe. The Israelites saw miracle after miracle in their history, yet they didn't enter the rest of God because of their unbelief. Their hearts were hardened. And the more their hearts hardened, the harder their hearts became. And we're going to talk about this more as we get into Jesus in this chapter talking about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The harder a heart gets, the harder a heart becomes. Hebrews 4, verse 4. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. That's why there's a Sabbath. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. How important it is that we're not caught, we, we, we don't get caught up in the withering process. Many people are withering away in this world. They're so focused on the things of this world that they're just withering away spiritually. And others are so caught up into legalism that they can't enter the rest because they're not believing in the finished work of Christ. He did it. He obeyed it for us. We're off the hook. Blomberg again writes this, and we'll close with, close with this. The New Testament nowhere equates Sunday or Lord's Day observance with Sabbath keeping. Nor does it suggest that the Sabbath is to be treated any differently from other Jewish ceremonial days and rituals simply because of its presence in the Ten Commandments. The early church actually forbade any cessation of labor on the Sabbath, viewing such rest as Judaizing, legalizing. And by the way, the commandment about the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments is the only one of the ten not repeated in the New Testament. Just a by the way for you. For the first three centuries of church history, Gentile Christians rarely had an opportunity to rest anyway, inasmuch as the Roman work week did not provide for a weekly day off. Modern uh, Sabbatarianism is largely the legacy of Puritan legalism. To be sure, contemporary American Christianity desperately needs to recover the centrality of worship and of life in Christian community. But this is an entirely separate issue from Sabbath observance and not helped by injunctions against work or other activities on Sunday. So in short, as Christians, every day is a Sabbath for us. There's not a particular day that we have to observe. Every day is that day. So why do we meet on Sundays? Because the early church did. This was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And so they started meeting on Sundays corporately to worship him. 
And so that's what we do today. And to study his word together. And that's what we do today. But that's different. That's a different motivation than keeping a Sabbath. Are you following? So beware of legalism and beware of withering away. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you, um, Lord, for this, these chapters, especially chapters 12 and 13, uh, where um, so much of the, the thread is going to be put together or the puzzle is going to be put together um, as uh, you deal with these particular issues of the Sabbath and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and talking in parables and all of that, Lord. And um, God, we just uh, thank you that we've been set free of uh, these rules, these rituals, these, these things that men create that only bog us and bind us down and create guilt and, and all of that stuff that you never intended for us to, to go through. And that's just man trying to be worthy before God, which is not possible. Only through Christ Jesus. And so we thank you for Jesus, Lord. And we thank you for that finished work on the cross. It is finished, you said. Thank you, Lord, for you being obedient to the law, for you obeying these things and setting us free. Mm. Lord, we love you. And as we leave this place today, Lord, may we go in your spirit. May we be thankful and rejoice in this time of year because Emmanuel has come. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, let's all stand.
you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Bless you.